Good morning, everyone. Um, as mentioned, my name is Jason Sherwood. I actually uh, run a team of solution architects at Equinix. Uh, what I'm going to spend the next 20 minutes talking to you all about is around the interconnection-oriented architecture. So uh, IOA, we already mentioned the abbreviation. Um, and trying to make sense of that, and actually it will link with some of the stuff we were just talking about in terms of um, the fragmentation of the industry and how you then make all that come together. If you look at the industry, obviously it's in a, in a rapid um, period of dis 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 yeah, disruption right now. Um, a lot of boundaries being broken down. I'm not going to repeat a lot of the trends that were just uh, spoken by the previous presenter, which creates threats, but also creates a lot of opportunities in terms of new ways of doing things. Um, and that's what some of the things I want to explore today. I'm not going to read every bullet on the slide, but really there's so much going on in the industry. I mean, the digitization of the business is the absolute fundamental. Those workflows have changed, um, and the way one consumes and produces media has dramatically changed over the last few years, and even over the last few minutes, it seems. It's rapidly, rapidly moving. Um, if you look at me, the m and &E specific drivers that we have here, I mean, the way people are consuming content, and we talked about it a little bit just now, is just ra radically different than it was. I mean, the way I consume content, versus the way that my parents consume content, versus the way that my 13-year-old daughter consumes content. It's just completely different, and we're all correct. So we're having to deliver to me, to my parents, and to my daughter that same, potentially the same kind of content, but in completely different ways. The uh, broadcast transition to IP work workflows um, really creates a very different way of doing business. Um, while it may still be linear, you've got, um, you, you've got files moving around rather than tape. You've got that change going on in the industry. And then the big one I know has been a big topic of this particular conversation is obviously the, the ingest of the cloud. How does the cloud affect this? It's used as both an input mechanism as well as an output mechanism, but also a huge amount of workload productivity is done within the cloud. And we'll talk about some customers of ours that have really started driving the cloud to help drive things within the production process as well. And obviously, the data sets are growing dramatically with the higher and higher definition. So then how do you get that from one place to another in a very efficient manner? Uh, and that's something we'll be exploring as well. So really, the idea of the interconnection-oriented architecture is bringing everything together. So rather than having this we'll workflow one place, one to the next, one to the next, that sequential workflow, as we were just being talking about in the previous presentation, um, it's everybody collaborating in a single kind of matrix. Um, so everybody is connected all of the time in a high speed, low latency and secure environment where you can then innovate quickly with partners, you can make real term decisions, uh, you can really respond to the marketplace in a very efficient manner, and you grow an ecosystem of people kind of working together. Um, you grow that, hey, I've got all these various pieces of this production workflow, um, but we're all part of that one whole. Uh, and really what we're saying here is you know, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts, by bringing folks together and driving that interconnection of everybody together. So if I break it down a little bit, um, the way we like to think about it when we're thinking about the interconnection-oriented architecture is there's, there's a number of assets that kind of we're talking about. Um, one is people, whether that's people producing content, whether it's people working on content, or people consuming content. And how do we work best to get content out to them? Interconnecting locations, how do we get out, uh, how do we get to those various pieces of uh, real estate out there, how do we connect them in in a secure manner? And how do you produce the flexibility there? Because if you think about it, locations are no longer just you know, concrete buildings. Um, people move around and dramatic there, and people are coming in with content from all sorts of different locations. Then there's the cloud, I say. It's going to be a big topic of mine. It's one of the spe I spend most of my time working in, which is all around how do you interconnect with the cloud efficiently? How do you really derive the value out of the cloud? And it's not just one cloud. Um, there's multi-cloud uh, solutions out there now. We'll, we'll actually talk a little bit about one later on, where people are using different clouds for different applications. Um, and that's a big deal. Uh, so how do you actually do that? How, what's the best way of doing that um, in an efficient manner? And finally, interconnecting data. So there's so much data out there. How do we run that analytics? How do we derive value from that analytics in a real-time environment? So we've pulled, boiled this all together into this concept of the interconnected enterprise or the interconnected industry, um, which is you know, moving away from this siloed effect into everybody being distributed but internetworked in an efficient manner uh, and brought together in this kind of virtual whole. 
So just to kind of build it up, you know, traditionally we had these kind of silos. You had this silo here on, on the right-hand side of your screen there. Um, what we're saying now is let's, let's distribute that architecture. Let's get, we're looking at people all over the world, let's say, or all over the US, and you've got these users that need to access content, need to do work. Um, so there's users, there's buildings, there's various things that need to connect in, connect in to the data center infrastructure and pull information out. So how do you do that to create a low latency environment so people can get the best possible performance wherever they happen to be? Well, what we suggest is really pushing data, apps and data to the edge, getting your users closer to those apps and to the data. Um, and look, whether this is having a hub on the west, east, and central of the US, or whether we're talking about you know, Singapore, London, and LA. Whatever um, you, your particular infrastructure might require, distributing those apps out to the edge. And then overlaying the clouds on top of that. So getting close to those clouds, being able to connect to those clouds and derive the value of the cloud um, wherever it might be in the world again. And then bringing those data and analytics close to the users as well. Um, so you can then analyze data and make real-time decisions um, based on the data that you're getting in, for, in from various sensor points uh, throughout the industry. Really, all this kind of boils down to one thing. And if you take one thing away, I, this is one of my favorite ones. Um, service design and service quality, um, when you're talking about connecting people together, comes down to a latency question, as in, how close am I to you? Um, you can throw bandwidth and capacity at a problem, but there's a point where that doesn't work anymore. So that comes down to then, if I want to serve you in, you know, in the front row here, I'm going to get a much better service between me and the front row in terms of a latency than me in the back row. Uh, and that's really driving all the stuff we're talking about around the interconnection or architecture and why we're pushing the edge out to where it needs to be consumed. And this one kind of boils down to a very wordy slide here, but uh, to this idea of the interconnected era. You know, the cloud is dominating. Um, we're collaborating in communities. Um, we have these little small shops all over the place. It was shown on the previous presenter slides. Um, they're collaborating with people that may be in the larger industries and in the larger production houses. Um, it needs to be secure. It needs to be reliable. Um, those are two very key drivers as well. How do you do this interconnection without just kind of making it the free-for-all that it could potentially become? What I wanted to do for the next few minutes is just focus down on some of the stuff we've been doing specifically in the media space. Um, this is kind of the way I, I look at it. This is a linear workflow. I know it's not quite as linear as it used to, but if you think about breaking it, chunking it down, we have the creation piece, we have the content management, production, et cetera, and then we have the content delivery. Uh, and we've done a lot of work in all three of these areas, especially probably more in the middle and the end, um, less in creation. But I just wanted to explain some of the stuff that we've pulled together um, around Equinix and digital media workflow. If you look at workflow today, and this again it reiterates the previous presenter, um, a lot of very symmetric uh, workflow. One passes to the other, and the asset moves around. So the asset goes off to one of these nodes here in yellow, and then back into some way, and the asset goes to the next person, to the next person, to the next person. So you're moving the asset around, um, and obviously these assets become very, very large. We talked about the size of the data set growing and growing. So how do we kind of rejig this so? Um, we don't have this kind of linear flow, because the linear flow, as we've already established, is not kind of the way that life's going to work going forward. So we've got with the, the Equinix Media Cloud ecosystem is, how about we bring the assets to a place, and we have that centralized data lake or that centralized place of data, and then people access it remotely through secure, high-performance connections to work on that data. Um, you're bringing in all the various kind of production pods into this place, um, to then work on this as a centralized asset. But wait a minute, there's one piece missing from here. You need to bring the clouds into the equation as well. So then if you have this, this foundation in the middle there that then connects out to the various cloud providers, you're really creating a seamless production space, let's say. So you've got that red bucket there in the middle there where you have all the elements that can be worked on. And you can also derive whatever you may need out of the specific assets in the Google Cloud, Amazon, Microsoft, whomever you might want to use. This kind of idea of an ecosystem is something that we've done before in terms of bringing people together to make a, an efficient way of doing things. In the online advertising space, we did a lot of work with something we called Ad Exchange, 
But that was where, if, if you're familiar with the, the online advertising industry, um, when you go to a website and you get that annoying banner out on the side, especially personalized to you, that's all done with real-time bidding. Uh, and real-time bidding has some very specific SLAs around it in terms of 100 milliseconds to make that bidding window so that you get that banner ad that's specialized for you within that time frame. And what we thought, based on our you know, history in the financial ecosystem, is, hey, if we get people together, if we get those ad networks, the uh, demand-side platforms, sell-side platforms, ad exchanges together in a facility, and we, we have them not just on the east and west coast of the US, but worldwide, um, then they can trade in this high-frequency environment and get these latencies become much, much smaller, and they can make decisions and make much better, quicker um, bidding analysis being close to each other in that low latency environment. So we've kind of done this before in the ad system. And it's kind of the history of where we've come from as Equinix. And you can see the growth over the years in terms of interconnection. This is within an Equinix data center. I'm not talking about outside of it. We started off connecting networks together. We then brought in the various content providers as they wanted to get close to the networks, as they wanted to get more efficient ways of getting to the end user. Um, then we bring the financial customers in, the cloud providers came in, and our enterprise come in to consume all of those services. And you see the graph in the bottom left really shows that dramatic value that's being driven out of interconnection. And that's something that's very important to us, is the fact that people are really graining benefit out of specific cross-connections within our data centers. And there are already media companies out there um, connected to each other um, within our data centers. They're already there. They might, they're already there within these facilities. And we have a whole system whereby we can say, oh, look, so-and-so, the, these people are within our Silicon Valley facilities. Hey, why don't you guys talk to each other? You're only a cross-connect away, as was the tagline. Um, how about if one piece wants to talk to another, you just connect a cable. You're not worrying about networks. You're not worrying about security anymore. It's just a direct connection. So just to finish off, I got a few kind of deployments in action, as I like to call it. Um, what have we done? One of the uh, projects that we've been working on, and the ETC have been very involved with this, um, is the Suitcase Project, which is a small movie project, um, which we've been working on trying to prove out some of these concepts. Um, so what we're doing here is the little blue box in the middle is kind of an, is an Equinix facility, um, where we've stood up storage from Istachi. We've connected this infrastructure into the Google Cloud, into the Amazon Cloud. So then content is coming in um, through network providers, through SohoNet, um, on the left-hand side there, bring content in, working it within that blue box using all the facilities that are there, uh, and then also connecting out to the various output fields and other parties through more of an internet-based workflow. So really creating this hub within the middle of the picture. Another example I wanted to talk about was Endemol, which is in the Netherlands. Um, they were looking, this is, this, this is very much around, you know, how do they handle the workflows that they're trying to do? They were looking for a storage and archive solution. You know, how are they going to store these rapidly growing data sets? Um, they wanted an on-demand multi-platform delivery mechanism, um, just the same as we talked about, many people consuming things in different ways. Um, and they really wanted a flexible and secure uh, and scalable architecture for the future and how they can do their workflows. And they decided to do this in a couple of ways, using the cloud. So they directly connected to AWS for storage. And then they used the Microsoft Azure cloud for the transcoding requirements. So they've picked whichever cloud they thought was the best solution for this particular problem in hand. And then what they did, in this particular case, they had their headquarters location on the left there in the Netherlands. Um, they went across a network into an Equinix facility where those secure connections are to those clouds. So they're then directly connected to AWS. They're directly connected to Azure, which then protects them against any of the vagaries of network. So it's just like they're using this cloud on-prem uh, or using this you know, something under my desk, um, but I'm using it within the network because I've got a very predictable network performance there, and I'm getting directly to the clouds with the minimum latency, secure, et cetera. And not only that, they saved money by moving to the cloud with the virtualization. Um, they transcoded almost in real time, um, and they increased the, the level of, tr of simultaneous transcoding jobs they could do at any one time. So they really derived the value of the cloud without the downs potential downsides of the cloud in terms of concerns around latency and performance and security. Uh, and that's really kind of one of the themes I would want to talk through. Another example is with a, a UK-based broadcaster, which is doing live uh, Football games, I would say. Soccer games, I guess most people in the room might call it. Um, but uh, so 
they're taking all these various game feeds in and they have an SLA to get over 30 done in four hours in terms of creating highlight reels uh, to getting it out to their content providers. So they're taking the content in on the left-hand side of the diagram there. Um, they're taking it into one of our data centers in London. Um, then the people in their, in their HQ are then accessing that data in our location and doing all the VFX, the graphics, et cetera, within there. So the content is there in the data center. It doesn't leave. It's being worked on remotely by folks over a high performance network. Once that is then complete, that workflow can kind of continue kind of within the same environment over to the playout partners on the right hand side there. Some playout partners are actually within the Equinix facility. So it again is kind of across the floor or across the street. Uh, some go out across networking connections um, to other playout partners. So really building that complete workflow, and this looks very similar to that diagram I brought, put, brought up earlier in terms of keeping that content in one place and having people working on it remotely. So that's really, a, that, that's the summation of mine. Uh, that's, that's probably up to all my slides. Um, we're at Equinix, the interesting piece is we are this foundation of, you know, we have these 145 data centers around the world um, in 40 metropolitan areas, which really allows us to do that distributed architecture. So no matter where you might be, we can get close to those users and close to those clouds as well. Um, and those cross connects and those connects to the cloud are just a very, very important part of what we do. So that's the end of uh, mine. So I'd be happy to take any questions. All right, any questions here? What's a network? So, oh, there we go. There we go. <laughs> so, uh, do you see uh, containers and microservices and that workflow change affecting Equinix in your business? It's already, you know, the way, way I've been talking about here is this connection between um, we have Equinix as a, as a facility, but we have that connections into the cloud. So we're, we're definitely driving that multi-cloud environment. That's definitely part of our kind of DNA, um, is trying to be that neutral place. Uh, we always want to be the Switzerland, um, where you go, I don't care which network provider you use, which this you use, I don't care what cloud you use. Um, so our idea is really to become that grand central station um, of the cloud. So we have connections to Microsoft, Amazon, Google, Oracle, IBM, SoftLab, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so then the question is, um, the containerization concept becomes really interesting because then you can start talking about very much the multi-cloud, like I just talked about, passing data from one cloud to another in an efficient manner. Because um, right now, you know, that's the hard part, to be honest. You, I can talk about multi-cloud. In the particular example I gave was very simple because we're doing one thing there and one thing there. But if you start trying to want to pass a workflow from one cloud to the another and do things, like, that's where life gets a little interesting um, because obviously standardization isn't there and that's where containers can come in. Uh, and from an Equinix perspective, that's where we see us as the glue again um, of bringing that together. Just like the carriers back in the day were using it to connect between AT&T and MCI or Verizon. Um, now we're being there as that connection point between the various clouds to enable that kind of, kind of workflows. Anything else? Uh, I'm wondering why you're not moving to more of a software-defined network, software-defined data center <laughs> model and being, bringing actually everybody together in one place rather than actually bringing the users closer to the perimeter, why don't you just put the infrastructure in place in one place and let them screen scrape? I think I got most of the question. In terms of the SDN piece, we really, that's one of the things we really are driving. If you look at um, what we've done in terms of that cloud connection we were just talking about, um, historically, you connected between you know, this person and this person with a data center with a piece of cable. Um, we're absolutely looking at, um, oh, and actually we have done. If you, when we do that connection to the cloud, that's not over a cable anymore. That's a connecting into a bot, an SDN box effectively that then can send you off to whichever cloud you may want to uh, and creating more and more control and API facilities to be able to provide that flow. It's definitely something that my team and I are very, very focused on. You know, how do we drive that to, we're actually in a very good place for really helping to drive SDN because um, we do have all those various different paths to different clouds, to different networks, to different this, that, and the other, which is what SDN allows you to control. Um, so we're, we're in an interesting place in terms of be, being that meet me point to allow SDN. And we're working with a whole bunch of SDN providers or suppliers, box people, um, as well as managed services people about how we best fix, 
uh, kind of deliver into that space as well. So yeah, it's a really, really interesting space. And also just within the data center, say right now, most of our connections in the data center are done physically. Um, that's not likely to be the long, long, long-term future. Having some sort of switching infrastructure like we do with connection to the clouds today seems to be very likely. It helps at scale. Thank you so much, Jason. Yeah, thanks.